all webinar recordings are going to be posted on our website. So you can um, feel free to visit the website in a week and they will be up and you will be able to see them or share them with your friends. Um, all speaker questions are going to go into the Q&A. So if you look at your Zoom toolbar, you will see a Q&A section. That's for questions for the speakers. And at the end of the webinar, we're going to have um, a Q&A session where we will be addressing those questions. And the chat function is only for technical difficulties or if you're having problems with the webinar, you can ask questions there and we will try to help you. If you are here for pesticide recertification credits, uh, we will have a code word throughout the webinar and we also will have a poll question. Um, so we need your participation in those in order to receive that credit. And we have Oregon and Washington credits for this webinar. And finally, if you lose connection to the webinar, you're just going to rejoin using that same link that you found in your email. And if that still doesn't work, um, you're welcome to call in because there's a phone number in the invitation that you receive in the email and you can at least hear the audio that way. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Bush, the Executive Coordinator for the Washington Invasive Species Council. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today. This has been a very special week. Uh, this week, Governor Jay Inslee proclaimed the week as Invasive Species Awareness Week in solidarity with a national event. And events such as this were happening all around the United States and still are happening. Invasive species impact all elements of life in Washington, our agriculture, our recreation, our food security, there's really no end to the potential impacts. We're very lucky in Washington because some of the worst invasive species aren't yet present today. And we're trying to put the spotlight on some of these species and raise awareness of simple actions that anyone can take to help us prevent introductions of these new invasive species and also to stop the movement when they have arrived in Washington. Everyone has a really critical role to play and that starts with awareness as well as reporting, and then integrating simple actions into your daily lives. And it's very simple. Um, and one thing is uh, to be aware of invasive species and report them. And we have some great tools such as our Washington Invasive mobile application, or it can be as simple as brushing off your boots or cleaning your pet before you go hiking in your local natural area. There's very simple actions that can play a big role in stopping this problem. Uh, really appreciate your time and um, want, happy to be putting the spotlight on the spotted lanternfly because this is one of those species that may be the, one of the most impactful things in our generation. And we're at this really critical moment where we can prevent it from becoming a widespread problem in Washington. So with that, thank you. And I'll turn back to you, Maria. All right. Thank you so much. All right, I am going to turn it over to Joshua Milnes from the Washington State Department of Agriculture to get us started. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate to be here. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. So I'm going to uh, introduce myself quickly. My name is Josh Milnes. I actually work for Washington State Department of Agriculture. Uh, as a uh, entomologist, um, I've been studying the biology and ecology of the apple maggot complex. Uh, recently, I was in, uh, I became the uh, spot and lanternfly coordinator for the state. Not entirely sure if that's a good thing or not. We'll find out. Um, but with that said, though, um, let's talk about the uh, lanternfly. Let's see why is my there we go. So basically, what is uh, the uh, lanternfly? Uh, so spotted lanternfly. Lacoma de la Quechula is a plant hopper in the family of Fragoridae. There's about 129 uh, genera with about 696 species worldwide. Um, only nine genera and 17 species are present in North America. And worldwide, actually, Lacoma is represented by seven species. Uh, like most plant hoppers, they use their proboscis to feed on sap. Uh, think of it like a straw. Uh, that they use to feed on host plants. This is done by a piercing sucking effect where they use um, their proboscis to feed on carbohydrates found in the phloem sap, which are nutrient-rich compounds with many other plant products and usually lacking toxins. So we wanna kind of look over at the body of this insect. Um, 
So lanternflies, um, they have a pretty large um, body, actually. They're about an inch long uh, with their wingspan. As you can see, the proboscis here in the image is about a quarter of an inch. Um, inside the straw-like mouth part, there's actually two tiny stylet-like hairs that there's, um, they're just like a, a little thin, uh, they're thinner than human hair, so to speak, and again, inserted into the plant's tissue. And that's actually what lanternfly uses to salivate and probe and puncture the uh, plant tissues for uh, the uh, carbohydrates. Again, uh, lanternfly is a, a generalist feeder. It can feed on pretty much anything. Uh, they can easily adapt to their surroundings, which makes them a very difficult pest to deal with, in, uh, especially in a region like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, uh, I would like to point out uh, with uh, the uh, WCU extension, I'd like to uh, uh, point out Carrie Foss. Uh, we, we've, I collaborated with Carrie to develop this uh, life cycle with her program. Uh, with that said, I would like to quickly give a little background on the uh, insect and its biology, starting with the uh, life cy cycle. Typically, uh, lanternflies' eggs hatch in around May through June. Uh, starting in June through July, the first instars will molt, becoming the second instar. Uh, molting will happen again in mid-June through mid-July to give a third instar. And then July through September, you'll actually get the uh, fourth instar. It's actually about the fourth instar stage where you begin to start to see more, some of the distinctive colorations of their bodies. Uh, the uh, um, wing pads start to develop, of course, um, and they become more pronounced. My colleagues over on the East Coast have uh, mentioned that this is about the same time they start seeing a significant uptick from residents reporting that they've uh, witnessed spotted lanternflies. Uh, starting in late July through December, adults are present and do not overwinter. As the temperature drops to uh, freezing levels, adults will actually die off. Egg laying occurs from October through November, and then these eggs um, are found October through June of the following year when they begin to hatch and the life cycles actually continue. So again, one of the uh, dangers of this pest is that of the, uh, their mobility. Um, they actually have powerful hind legs. They'll actually use those to jump. Adults are actually also able to fly. So um, they're actually great at dispersal. It has actually been reported that they can move between three to four miles just by walking, jumping, and flying. So this makes this pest a, 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 a challenge to deal with, especially when we're trying to uh, mitigate the re at a region where this pest has been found. So again, this is one of its powerful um, assets is it is able to uh, uh, disperse. Uh, so we've talked a lot about how lanternflies feed, its life cycle, um, but what about its actual origins? Uh, where does it come from? Lanternfly is actually native to Asia. It's found all over China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. It was actually introduced in Japan, uh, South Korea, and recently in 2014, in the state of Pennsylvania in Burke County. This image here is a really cool geographical uh, map highlighting just uh, how far away from its natural habitat lanternfly is capable of uh, spreading. In South Korea, it quickly got out of hand and spread all over the country in a matter of just three uh, years. Um, and then they consider it as invasive species over there, reported to be neg negatively impacting uh, the uh, grapes and peaches. So that's actually a real concern to here in Washington. In Pennsylvania, the uh, story has been a significant difference thanks to those who are working hard to uh, control the invasive pest. With that said, I should point out lanternfly has also been detected in 14 eastern states, uh, and there will very likely be more down the road. So I'd like to point out Connecticut, Delaware, Delaware Massachusetts, uh, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, um, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, I, um, Ohio, Rhode Island, uh, Indiana, and recently, of course, in uh, Michigan, there's been a detection. Uh, to show the spread of the lanternfly, I'd like to point out here in this map here. This map detects a handful of counties, including the uh, Burke County, which is right here. I hopefully you can see my cursor. So here you've got um, Burke County, and it actually uh, um, spread all throughout the region. Um, so, uh, so it's interesting to see just the uh, quick distribution of this pest. So I like to point out lanternflies actually don't bite, they don't sting. Uh, it does not kill all the trees it feeds on, but, lantern, uh, but the spotted lanternfly is actually a plant stressor um, that, along with the other stressors, can cause a significant damage to its host, um, causing the host to actually eventually uh, um, be outcompeted, so to speak. 
With that said, um, I'd like to point out the economic impact of this insect. Um, the, in the industry here could be uh, susceptible. Think of this map as a, uh, weather a weatherman map where uh, the red regions here, this is a suitable host for the uh, lanternfly. So you can see up and down the I-5 corridor near King, King County, Whatcom and uh, Clark, there's actually a lot of uh, opportunity for this pest to establish. And of course, here in the, uh, the uh, agricultural industry region, there's plenty of um, prime real estate for this pest. So this is a very con concern. Um, through the West Coast, we have a uh, $10 billion valued uh, um, commodities. And so obviously lanternfly could establish in many of these. And so this is very susceptible region. Uh, lanternfly is a polyphagous feeder, meaning it has 172 different host plants that it will be able to uh, uh, establish on. So one of the reasons why I say this is important is because it's just how difficult it is to contain this pest. So it's worth pointing out. Um, so basically, uh, what one of the main concerns that we're concerned actually about in Washington state is because the addition to all the different um, damage, uh, we're, we're worried about the uh, um, the uh, let's see the damage on grapes. It also poses a risk to orchards, hardwoods, and nursery industries. All of these industries are major contributors to our economy. So lanternfly uh, poses a significant economic risk to what um, to our uh, valley here in the Yakima region. In Pennsylvania, lanternfly populations have been detected managing grapes, and the damage is significant. Uh, where the uh, spot, spotted lanternfly feeds on grapes, they execute, um, then they excrete their waste. Uh, that waste is called honeydew. Honeydew is actually a very sugary substance, and as they feed and excrete it, it lands on the grape leaves. And you can see clearly on this image here. Um, let's see here. There's a uh, uh, honeydew is actually um, it's all over the uh, surface of these leaves. And what happens is it prevents the uh, photosynthesis occurring, promoting uh, sooty molds. This can actually be detrimental. We've got growers reporting uh, um, because of all this pressure, uh, their uh, vineyards have uh, suffered uh, high damage on the uh, East Coast. So sadly, you can only um, unfortunately apply certain chemicals uh, so late into the season as the adults continue to feed late into the year. This is where it poses a risk to actually um, the growth, the grape industry. Actually, to show the spread, is, um, so one of the things that we find it important, Washington State is the largest producer of premium wines um, in the nation with bottles sold in all 50 states, um, exported worldwide as well. Uh, according to the Washington State Wine Commission, we are home to over 1,000 wineries uh, with more than 400 grape growers and over 60,000 um, acres of vineyards. With a total economic, in, excuse me, a total economic impact of about uh, $8.4 billion value added. So you can see why WSDA is taking this very seriously um, when we're talking about uh, spotted lanternfly uh, possible establishment in Washington. Um, the good news is it is not here. However, uh, we're not taking any chances. So since 2018, uh, we've actually been surveying for this pest. We've been actually monitoring for quite a while. Uh, you can see here on our map, we've um, outlined all of the uh, vineyards, great, uh, great vineyards. Most of them you can see are in the lower Yakima Valley. Uh, we've actually been able to uh, monitor those regions, and I have good report to tell you. Uh, in my line of work, zeros are always the best report. So we only we won't we haven't found anything. So that's actually fantastic. Um, so then this is this is one of the things we're being proactive on. Back in 2022, uh, we actually uh, in collaboration with the uh, WISC program, we've actually been surveying for Tree of Heaven and a, a reproductive host of the uh, uh, lanternfly. More will be said upon this later. Uh, this is actually an, a key uh, um, host that we're looking at for uh, this prevent and, and re hopefully remove so that lanternfly can uh, uh, have a more difficult time establishing in Washington state. So we're, uh, we're being proactive and uh, this is kind of one of those unusual moments in life where we can actually say we are being proactive versus being reactive. So it's rare as an entomologist to have that um, um, luxury, I guess that one could say. So that's actually very exciting to uh, uh, report to everyone here. Okay, so we're gonna start uh, shifting over to hitchhiking, lanternfly hitchhiking. So basically, uh, spotted lanternfly adults can actually lay on average between 30 to 50 eggs. They can be laid on trees and any other smooth surfaces. Uh, nymphs are, act uh, are active crawlers, as I said earlier. And every day the, they crawl up and down the plants uh, that they feed on. Adults begin to appear in late summer again. They feed primarily on trees of heaven. Uh, they mate and lay their eggs. 
In South Korea, females lay eggs twice before dying. In the US, it looks like just one generation is made uh, per season. But, that, but uh, they do have the potential, I should point out, to produce two generations. So uh, female spotted lanternflies are capable of carrying up to 150 eggs. Uh, if, if you recall earlier, I said spotted lanternfly females produce uh, 30 to 50 egg mass, eggs per egg mass. So it is possible that they can lay eggs up to three times, but they have yet to be observed to do so. Fortunately, in the East Coast, we're uh, hoping that they'll have some um, de uh, developed programs so we can uh, uh, validate those programs here when the uh, lanternfly comes, because it's no longer a question of are they coming, but when are they coming? Uh, as you can see um, on these photos here, uh, lanternfly can just lay about lay their eggs on any substrate. This is one of the indicators of how incredibly mobile these insects really are. Um, even nymphs, when they can't fly, they're able to move around. Um, their, their ability to lay their eggs on any surface includes stone, man-made objects. One of the things that makes lanternfly an incredibly good hitchhiker is that all the uh, stages of the spotted lanternfly are capable of uh, hitchhiking. So that's going to make this a very difficult uh, pest to deal with. So let's, uh, let's rewind the clocks a little. Um, the first lanternfly detections uh, made in Pennsylvania. Um, it was actually, it looks like a uh, lanternfly actually with hitchhiked its way fr um, from Asia to um, Pennsylvania on a shipment of landscape rocks, either on a pallet or on, on the rocks themselves. We don't really know and it's, it's, it's what it is. So again, we are doing everything we can here um, to monitor the situation and make sure we don't have lanternfly ever come into our state. So again, this is one of the reasons why we don't want to have a landing fly. Um, my colleagues on the East Coast are struggling. They, they've got to deal with these uh, pests. Um, the numbers are out of, uh, out of control. There aren't any real natural enemies over there that are adapting to this pest. Um, they have a smorgasbord of uh, host plants. Um, you can see here that um, they're trying some different type of traps to uh, adapt to this insect, and it's not really working well. Um, but uh, it, this is the kind of um, pest, again, the kind of density of pests that I really don't want to see here in Washington State. Because of the relative ease of hitchhiking, I'm actually working with my supervisor, um, um, Sven Eric Spanger, who is actually, uh, I should mention, was at Ground Zero in Burke County um, in Pennsylvania when spotted lanternfly actually arrived in the uh, state. Uh, we have been studying rail uh, properties, airports, uh, marine time ports, trans transportation corridors, and uh, commercial industrial distribution hubs as possible methods of actual um, introduction into Washington state. You can see in this, um, basically this map here, the whole um, region is spread out with railroads that uh, can link us up to the East Coast. This is a great way for the hitchhikers to, uh, or lanternflies to hitchhike over to uh, the Pacific Northwest, as well as the uh, entire West Coast. And just to make things exciting, here we go. We're gonna uh, we're gonna ship the uh, lanternfly over to Washington. Woo! There we go. So it's over here now. So this is actually one of the uh, uh, concerns. Look at that. It, it only just takes one mated female. Uh, we've got examples of lanternfly coming into Oregon. Fortunately, those were dead upon arrival. Uh, same with uh, reports over in um, California. So this is again, it's not a question anymore of is it coming to Washington State, but when is it coming, and can we be ready in time? I'm hoping we will, and that's one of the reasons why I'm pushing hard and actually submitting grants to uh, uh, survey and remove their host plants, at least the uh, noxious weeds, in order to uh, um, slow down the spread. So we would have some time to actually deal with this pest before it becomes a problem like, let's say, uh, cobbling moth or um, uh, brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, with that, I do want to point out um, we've got some uh, really uh, big questions to ask you guys. What can you guys do to help? I mean, that's, that's, that's probably the most important question. So um, we, we've got some um, uh, strategies here, how you guys can help uh, with our program. If you find something suspicious, you know, uh, see it, snap it and report it. So that's one of the things I really would uh, like is if you find something that's interesting, give me a holler. I really would like to know what, what you're finding. Um, you can also contact the uh, pest program. Uh, here's their website. Um, you can use your phone or tablet. Um, you can also use the uh, Washington Invasive Species Council app, which is free. Um, it's for both Android as well as the um, uh, iPhone. So yeah, take advantage of this. And then of course, here's our contact number. Yeah, so I, I really um, encourage you guys, uh, be vigilant, look out, keep looking, um, the enemy's coming. <laughs> oh boy. 
I joke, but it's not it's not a joke. Um, so with that, I, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, Justin, to you. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. My pleasure. All right. Um, let's see. Perfect. OK, great. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Ann Schuster with the uh, Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. Ann? Thank you. Um, Maria, can you let me know uh, what time I should try to finish at? Yeah, so you have um, at least 15 minutes. Okay. So yeah, 1035, 1040. Okay, my uh, slideshow takes a little bit to load. Oh boy, I can't get to the controls because of, there we are. Oh my gosh. I didn't detach from my computer in time. This will work better, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. So I'm gonna go over Tree of Heaven, how to identify it, um, what it might look like appearance-wise, and then maybe if I have time, um, some how to control it and alternative plants to plant in its place. So Tree of Heaven is a class C in Washington state which means it's not required for control in any county unless they have selected it for their own control or for their own education purposes. Um, some counties have done this, I'm not sure which. Um, and it was originally listed because it spreads really fast. It forms thickets. It also turns out it's allelopathic, which means it creates compounds that are toxic to other plants. So it makes it easier for the tree of heaven to grow and harder for other plants to grow, just making competition easier for it. It is a tree or shrub. It actually grows quite fast and it reproduces in a number of ways. It reproduces well by seed, but also by root suckers and sprouting from the stump if you don't treat the stump with herbicide after cutting it down. So generally it has a bad smell if you were to mush the leaves a little bit. Uh, I think it smells like rotten peanut butter. Um, some people think it smells a little bit like vomit. Uh, some people like the smell of it. Um, I try not to judge them. Uh, it can grow up to 30 meters tall and it can grow one to two meters a year in the right condition. So it can get up to 30 meters pretty quickly relative to other trees. They usually live 30 to 50 years old, but we have some really old specimens around Washington, um, over a hundred years old, some of them. They flower in April through July, usually June in Washington. And at least the seeds are only viable for a year in the soil. So that's something, it's not like scotch room where the seeds can be viable in the soil for decades. The seeds spread really easily on the wind. They're kind of a similar material texture to uh, like big leaf maple seed pods where they just can just blow away. So that helps them spread really far and fast. The leaves um, are actually made of, of many leaflets. So this is somebody holding a leaf made up of many, many leaflets. And you can see the leaves are pretty large, whereas the leaflets are quite a bit smaller. Those individual leaflets do not have serrated edges. They have smooth edges, except for the very base of them. They have lobes. And on the underside of those lobes are little glands that you can really feel very easily. Um, that might be where the smell is coming from, I'm not sure. Uh, and you can also see those glands if you're looking for them. The midrib of that leaf between all those leaflets usually is red, especially the more sun the plant gets. And um, that's most of the stuff I want to see on the leaves. They can get, I believe, over a foot tall, a foot long, I mean. So, um, and even the leaflets can get like six inches long. So pretty big leaves, especially on trees towards the end of the season that are older. The bark on Tree of Heaven is pretty smooth. Um, it has some fissures on it that are kind of diamond shaped, but it's pretty smooth to the touch. It's not really rough. It doesn't, it's not flaky. It's usually a pretty smooth gray color, maybe a little bit brown. And the stems, when they first start out, they start out green to red, and it really depends on how much sun they're getting, but they're also covered in a very fine covering of very, very small hairs. 
So in that picture of those of that red stem, it has kind of a silvery sheen to it. And that's the very, very small hairs that are absolutely covering those younger stems. Uh, the inside of the stems are pithy, uh, spongy. So if you were to break it, it's kind of soft on the inside there. And if you were to break off a branch uh, it leaves, or a leaf scar, it leaves a leaf scar that is heart-shaped with kind of a little nubbin in the cleft of the heart. So that's another way to tell it apart um, if you were to break off one of those leaves. The flowers come out, like I said, in June. For the most part, plants are either male or female, but the flowers look very, very similar. Even the females have sterile stamens on them. And, but only the female plants produce seed. And those seeds come out in September-ish. That's when they're really the most obvious from a distance. So the individual flowers are light, sometimes light green, but white generally with five petals and pretty exerted stamens that the pollen is on, at least in terms of the males that have the pollen. And they grow in these clusters that are kind of cone-shaped um, and they grow all over the tree. They're kind of big. They can be up to a foot wide. Uh, and generally the male plants produce a lot more flowers in those cones than the female plants. Once the seeds start to grow, they start off green, but they will age through yellow and into a tan or a red. And that's when they're the most obvious on those female plants. If you're driving around I-5 um, and along the Columbia Gorge in September, you'll see these trees with big, big bunches of kind of tan seed pods. And that's the tree of heaven. So that's the best time to really, I guess, survey for them, at least for the female ones, because they're very, very obvious at that point in the year. So I'm gonna go through some lookalikes of Tree of Heaven now that you know some of the key points to identify Tree of Heaven. So one is a, our native smooth sumac, and it looks similar just because it has, its leaves are made of leaflets, just like Tree of Heaven, and it has a red midrib along that leaf. But each one of those leaflets are lightly serrated. So that's one way you can tell it apart. The bunches of flowers on smooth sumac are very tight together and the flowers are very small. And the seeds look are red and almost velvety in appearance um, and they just are a really dense cone. So they don't look at all like the papery uh, seeds of Tree of Heaven. The stems are much hairier, at least the younger stems are. They don't get quite as red unless they're in the sun and they don't have a pithy center and the whole tree does not have a bad sense of smell. I mean, a bad smell. So it's, um, those are all differences. Also, if you're to break open one of the stems to see if it has a pithy center, they have a milky sap inside uh, these smooth sumacs. So that's some ways to tell it apart. Another lookalike is staghorn sumac, and this is a non-native sumac. Uh, these ones get up to 20 feet tall, so taller than our smooth sumac. The bark is rougher than Tree of Heaven and also just a warmer brown. The stems are also much hairier than Tree of Heaven and the leaflets are also serrated without the lobe at the bottom. Uh, so those are ways you can tell them apart. And similar to our smooth sumac, the flowers are in a very tight bunch cone that are very small and the seeds look almost velvety and they're very small and they grow in upright cones on those leaves, on, on, from the stems. Um, and similar to the native sumac, they don't have a pithy center, they don't have a foul smell, um, and I believe they also have a milky sap. The last lookalike I want to go over is black walnut. So this is another non-native um, it's also allelopathic, just like Tree of Heaven, so it makes it harder for other plants to grow underneath it. They can grow um, just as tall as Tree of Heaven, uh, 50 to 75 feet tall. They're a big tree. 
their leaflets also have serrated edges. So these plants that have gone over, only Tree of Heaven has smooth edges, except for those lobes at the very bottom. And for the most part, they don't have a, a red midrib on that between those leaflets, uh, unless they're probably a stressed plant could potentially have a red midrib, but they're going to be green for the most part. The flowers don't look like showy flowers. They're drooping green catkins, kind of similar to uh, like an alder catkin, um, kind of similar in appearance, just that's how catkins kind of look. The fruits are big round walnuts that start green and age to brown, so very different from Tree of Heaven. The bark is also really, really coarse and gray. It's um, very rough to the touch, unlike Tree of Heaven bark, which is very smooth. So you're going to want to know what you're looking for for Tree of Heaven to control it, to help stop soil lanternfly before you decide if you want to control a plant, because you don't want to control the wrong plant. You don't want to remove a plant that might be holding space that Tree of Heaven could take over if you were to remove it. So that's why I went through those lookalikes. But now I'm going to go through some control options for Tree of Heaven. So you can do mechanical and manual control, especially if the plant is small and you can actually get out the entire root. They do have really big roots, even when they're small. So a lot of digging is probably going to be required. You can't just cut the plant and forget about it even when it's small. Uh, it'll just come back from any root left behind. Uh, you have to make sure that you dispose of any plant material. Uh, that usually means in the garbage. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of composting doesn't get hot enough to kill stems and stuff, but you can dry it out on the soil if it's not moist and it, that should kill it as well. You can also uh, completely chip up an entire tree and that will work as well. After you remove a tree of heaven, especially a larger one, you'll want to monitor over 50 feet away for suckers coming up from its roots. So it can come up in your neighbor's yard, across the freeway, all over from one that you remove. Chemical control is a really good option because of those root runners and because it will come back from any stump left behind or any root left behind. And even chemical control usually requires um, a few treatments uh, depending on how effective it was on your timing and the, the herbicide you chose. So foliar spray is the current method of choice for controlling Tree of Heaven. Once the leaves are fully out, you can just spray the leaves with glyphosate or triclopyr, and that will translocate the herbicide into the roots of the tree. But when you're doing this, you want to make sure you're not doing it on like a windy day or when there's a lot of desired plants underneath it, because uh, it could drip down onto those desired plants and you don't want to kill those. Another good option is a basal bark application, and you'll want to do that in late winter, early spring, and in the summer, that would mean painting on the herbicide, uh, usually an oil-soluble triclopyr product, in like a foot band all around the base of the tree, of the trunk, and so that will be absorbed into the tree and into the roots. You can do a similar uh, method with hack and inject, so you make cuts into the tree and then you put the herbicide, like glyphosate or dicamba, or mazapir into those cuts that you made and then the herbicide will go into the roots that way. If you're going to cut down a tree of heaven, just treat it. Just within 45 minutes, uh, put herbicide on that stump. It doesn't matter um, if you treat it other ways, if you didn't treat it other ways, it's better to be safe than sorry, because if you cut it down, it will come up in your neighbor's yards or across the highway. So it's best to, when in doubt, cut, the, uh, cut when you have to cut the tree down, it's best to treat it immediately. Um, and you can use glyphosate, triclopyr, dicamba for that cut stump treatment. Just paint it right on the surface that you cut. And as always with any herbicide treatment, you always want to make sure you follow label directions, all your local laws and regulations, uh, make sure you're wearing proper personal protective equipment, um, make sure that you are spraying at the right time of day, time of year, you're not going to be harming things like 
uh, pollinators or your neighbor's alfalfa in the field. There, you can, there are lots of options for other plants for cultural and biological control. Um, right now, there's only research going into biological control for Tree of Heaven. That means people are researching uh, usually an insect, sometimes a fungus or other species that will feed on it and kill it and uh, stop its, help stop its spread. But right now there's nothing approved in biological control methods. Grazing, like with cattle, can weaken the roots if it's done continuously. But if the cattle or any livestock eat more than, I think it's maybe 15, 20% of its diet as Tree of Heaven, they can get sick. So it's good to limit their amount of Tree of Heaven that they ingest. Once you get out Tree of Heaven, it's really important to plant desired vegetation that will shade out any seedlings. Tree of Heaven seedlings can grow in shade, but they don't do quite as well. So it's really important to get a healthy sand of vegetation or at least a weed tarp down to prevent seeds uh, from coming in from your neighbors or coming up through the soil. Uh, some alternatives for Tree of Heaven are uh, ashes. They look similar and they're a good alternative uh, also, the sumacs that are lookalikes are another good alternatives to Tree of Heaven um, if you're looking to replace Tree of Heaven in like a garden or, or ornamental site. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Anne. All right. Our last speaker for today is Jessica LaBelle with the Washington Invasive Awesome. Thank you. Are you seeing the correct version of my slides? Uh, no, actually. No. No. <laughs> Good. Let's see. How's that? There you go. Yep. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Saturday morning. My name is Jessica Bell, and I am the Invasive Species Program Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. I'm here to talk to you today about um, spotted lanternfly, ways that it can move around, and how Washington is preparing. So on this map that shows the current spread of spotted lanternfly, um, in the United States. Again, the first initial detection was in Pennsylvania in 2014. So if you look at this, this is what, like 14 states with active infestations, as well as a few others, including Michigan and Ohio. Um, oh, no, they have active infestations too. Um, 14 states, all of this originated from one introduction of spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, uh, believed to be on a shipment of stone coming from Asia, like Josh Milnes mentioned, but this just shows how catastrophic an introduction of an invasive species can be. So this shows the potential distribution of spotted lanternfly in the United States. Um, a study was done looking at habitat suitability for these guys. Um, the white area is unsuitable, but all the other colors on the map are places where they could establish, and red being the, uh, the, the highest suitabil suitability for habitat for these guys. And this is of big concern. As you can see, it's almost half of the United States, as well as um, these insects have over 170 known species of plants that they'll feed on, and a lot of them are pretty economically and culturally significant. So we've got grapes, hops, cherries, peaches, almonds, pine, some other conifers, hardwoods, um, as well as culturally significant first foods for tribal nations and traditional medicines. So also as they continue to sweep westward, I mean, the list of host plants is continually being updated. Um, as they find a taste for new things. So here's another uh, view from that study. It's just showing the inset of Washington. And as you can see, that's a pretty big concern. We have quite a bit of suitable habitat for a spotted lanternfly. And it really includes that I-5 corridor 
in Western Washington and then of great concern, um, really the agricultural breadbasket of Washington on the left and east or on the right in Eastern Washington. So if spot lantern fly were to establish there it could have significant economic impact um, and an impact on our food supply. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from this webinar, it's that if you think you've seen a spotted lantern fly, take a picture and report it. Um, take a picture, note the location, report it to us um, via uh, contacting the Washington State Department of Agriculture at pestprogram at agr.wa.gov. Um, on your phone or tablet using the Washington Invasives app. That's a free app through the Washington Invasive Species Council. Or you can call the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Pest Hotline at 800-443-6684. Um, save the specimen if you can. Spotted lanternfly can't hurt you. They don't bite, they don't sting. You can handle them safely. If you don't like touching bugs, um, you can actually get like a disposable plastic water bottle. Just take the cap off, put the, the opening of the water bottle kind of close to the insect, squeeze it, it'll just suck it in there. Um, so there's actually, if you want to YouTube ASMR and spotted lanternfly, um, there's quite a few videos of people on the East Coast where these are established just doing that as a form of entertainment. So uh, I really can't understate the role of the public in controlling spotted lanternfly. Um, I've worked on many invasive species projects over the years and an incredible amount of progress has been made just due to public reports. We're a small team of just a few people kind of scattered around, but we need eyes everywhere. And that's really how the public can help us. So if you're outdoors, if you're recreating, you're hiking, you're gardening, um, you're just enjoying a beverage on the back porch. You know, please, if you see something strange, take a photo of it and report it, especially if you believe it's spotted lanternfly. Okay, so again, spotted lanternfly is not here yet, but let's talk about some of the ways that they could get here and how invasive species move around. Now, many people think that animals or insects are maybe just kind of expanding their range under their own power and that's how they move around. And sometimes that is true, but most of the time that's not the case. They really end up being moved by people. It's not intentional, but as we learned during the pandemic, it's not just local resources that keep society running. A lot relies on travel and transportation. So I like to say anything that moves can move invasive species. So think about, you know, when you are at a stoplight and you look up at your windshield and you notice there's a little bug hanging on and you're like, oh, buddy, you're going to Yakima today because that's where I'm driving, you know. <laughs> they can be moved on vehicles. Um, they can be moved when people move across the country or move from one in, an infested area to an uninfested area. Spotted lantern fly, like laying their egg masses on smooth surfaces, and that includes, you know, outdoor furniture, uh, kids toys that are outdoors, you know, the plastic pools, like all kinds of different things. So when you're moving, please, you know, make sure that your, your stuff is clean when you're moving it and kind of give it a once over for invasive species. Uh, recreational vehicles, folks that are going camping, um, I like to think that the little icon of, on the top of this is the kayak. So that's a very popular recreational pastime in Washington and not so much for spotted lanternfly, but for aquatic invasive species, super important to clean, drain and dry your boats and water gear um, before you leave the water body so that you're not moving aquatic invasive species around, even if it's just a single person kayak. Okay, so as part of uh, living in Western Washington, when I'm thinking about Seattle or Tacoma, I'm really thinking about the culture, I'm thinking about the different things to do in the city, I'm thinking about the traffic and how long it's gonna take me to drive there. Um, well, one thing that people don't think about is that the Port of Seattle and the Port of Tacoma are some of the largest and busiest ports in the United States. 
So shipping containers, international shipping, those are all ways that invasive species can enter the country. And then of course, air travel. Um, there have been known instances of spotted lanternfly coming from East Coast states to the West Coast on aircraft. They've had dead specimens that were found um, on planes or within planes. So here's some other pathways that you might not think about that often. Um, plants, a lot of the plants that you buy for your garden or as house plants, they may not have originated in Washington. So nurseries, other plant retailers, um, those can be inadvertent ways that plant pests are introduced into the state. And then you, your boots, think of all the places that your shoes go in a day. Um, so you can move weed seeds and eggs from different insects in the cleats of your shoes or maybe stuck on the fabric of your shoes or boots. So please uh, clean your shoes before you leave an area to prevent moving things around. And you can do that just with like a little boot brush. And another one here, um, firewood. So many invasive insects take shelter in or lay their eggs in wood piles. So please don't move firewood and purchase firewood locally. Purchase it where you're going to use it to prevent the spread of invasive species. So this goes back to this map that um, Josh showed, which is another potential pathway we're really concerned about, which is the rail system. So Philadelphia Department of Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, I do that every time. Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture actually did a study on how spotted lanternfly were moving around New England and found that they were using the rail system. And uh, they really seem to like rusty surfaces. Um, so rail cars, um, all that kind of thing were very popular for them laying their eggs on and for traveling on. And as you can see here in some of the fainter uh, numbers on this slide, that shows the days in transit from one area to another. So really um, spotted lanternfly could appear here at any time and in under a week from in, moving from an infested area. So again, they're not here yet, um, but we are definitely keeping them on the horizon and preparing for them. They can really only, they don't fly super well for long distances. You know, they can, they can travel a couple miles um, by jump, a combination of jumping and crawling and flying. That's a pretty motivated lantern fly, but all the life stages can hitchhike to new areas. So I've got some photo uh, drawing of the egg mass here, some photos of the different, different nymph stages and what they look like. And, um, a photo of a spotted lantern fly kind of taking a ride on somebody's car. Um, dead specimens have been found in California and Oregon, so they can get to this side um, pretty easily. And again, we really need your help for early detection. Early detection is gonna be what makes a big difference in controlling this pest. So what is the state of Washington doing about it? Well, we received a $90,000 grant from the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, Plant Protection and Quarantine, which is a really long name. So we usually refer to it as USDA APHIS PPQ. And that is to uh, prepare for spotted lantern fly. The first thing of which is to develop the spotted lantern fly preparedness advisory group. We've done that. I'm the facilitator for that group. And that includes um, all these members on the right, many different state agencies, some federal partners, tribal nations, and then industries that could be impacted by spotted lantern fly were it to establish here, or industries that might inadvertently be a pathway of introduction for spotted lantern fly. This is really important because we didn't just want to have one state agency just writing the rule book for how we're going to deal with this. We wanted everyone's voices so this could be the most effective um, plan. So then we're also developing mapping tools showing Tree of Heaven locations. Tree of Heaven, like uh, Ann and Josh talked about, is super important to spotted lanternfly. Um, they can live without it, but they're not as reproductively viable without it. So there's an interesting relationship between spotted lanternfly and Tree of Heaven 
um, where they really need exposure to it at some point in their lifetime to become really reproductively hardy. So that's why we're focusing a lot on that. Our mapping tools not only show tree of heaven locations, but also potential pathways for them coming into the state, resources that are at risk, like certain kinds of crops, and also at-risk communities. Um, then we're also holding industry and stakeholder workshops and public webinars like this one. And then right now we're developing the state action plan, which is gonna be used as a template for future plant health emergencies and is really gonna be a step-by-step -step of what to do when spotted lanternfly gets here. And that's being written right now. So the state action plan um, is trying to be a broad-based and all-inclusive plan. I'm trying to learn from all the different things other states have done when they've experienced spotted lanternfly. So it's gonna focus on both short-term and long-term management in case it establishes, monitoring and outreach, um, early detection, rapid response, um, eradication methods that we could use in different circumstances, Quarantine and rulemaking, that doesn't necessarily mean we're setting those up ahead of time, but we're outlining the steps so that it's streamlined when the time comes, those processes can move as quickly as possible. Also focusing on tree of heaven control and removal and outlining the different potential economic and cultural impacts um, to our state if spotted lanternfly um, were to become established here as well as rounding all these up and gathering all this information on best practices so we can share this with other states and learn from other states. So my contact information is here, as well as some information on the Washington Invasives app, which is available on the Google Play and the Apple Store, and I highly encourage you to download it. So Great. Thank you so much. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. All right. I would like to invite the audience to please put any questions you have for the speakers in the Q&A. Um, and while you're thinking of your questions, I wanted to launch a poll. Um, so your poll, the poll should pop up on your screen. Um, please read it and um, select your answer. Right. Excellent. Everyone, everyone got the important message here. Yes. If you see a spot lantern fly, please take a good picture. It's really important to have a good picture um, and then report it on the uh, Washington Invasives app or to the pest program at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Oh, I didn't share the results. Here we go. All right. Any questions? Yes, so I'll ask the first question. Josh Mills, you said that the Washington State Department of Agriculture is actively seeking funding. What can you speak a little more to that? What are you seeking and what are you intending to do? That's a good question. Yeah. So um again, we've been looking into uh additional funding, as uh, Jessica mentioned, through uh uh, the uh, APHIS uh, PPA. Um, we've also been looking into funding and we're, we're in the process of being approved. Well, um, we got through phase one of a special crop block grant with uh, Washington State Department of Ag. So we're hoping to get some funding to uh, remove Tree of Heaven. I showed in one of my slides, um, last year we were surveying for uh, the uh, potential uh, sites or what I'm referring to as uh, key, port, uh, key sites for Tree of Heaven removal. Um, so what the goal of this uh, grant, I'm hoping we can get somewhere around 250,000 bucks to uh, basically uh, remove tree of heaven in key sites like ports, rail, ra railways, um, areas that potentially could allow a lanternfly to establish. The object of, or the objective, of course, is to uh, 
slow the uh, spread of the uh, the uh, bug before we have a chance and give us a chance to actually um, contain it or hopefully eradicate it. That is the ultimate goal. Um, if we if we um, spend more time uh, trying to figure out what to do, it, it eventually will become too late. So we have to be proactive, and that's again um, we're in a very uh, interesting uh, situation where we can actually be proactive versus reactive with this pest. And so I, I like to keep it that way. Um, this, the crisis isn't here. Let's, let's, let's be uh, aggressive with this. And hey, it's, it's also removing host plants for, let's say, brown marmorated stink bug and the yellow spotted stink bug. So, I mean, there's, there's other pests that go after the tree of heaven. It's not just the uh, lanternfly. So uh, this is a win-win for everybody. All right, there's a, Q, a question in the Q&A that says, what do you recommend to control them if you find them? Is this, is this uh, targeted for me or? Uh, anyone, but yes. <laughs> Anyone who wants to answer? <laughs> well, there are um, right now, um, what we would like to do, uh, just because it's so early, we, again, I, and I should be very clear with this, we do not actually have lanternfly in Washington state, at least it's not been detected. Um, so for now, um, if you find something, uh, take a picture, grab it, and contact us as early as possible. We don't have to uh, deal with mitigate uh, with eradication if we are able to uh, respond to it quick. So that's that's something um, I can't really give uh, pesticide advice because I work for the state. Um, what I can do is point you to uh, Penn State uh, University for uh, a lot of the um, um, IPM or integrated pest management uh, methods to deal with the pest. So what I would say at this point is. Uh, respond to us. Let us know if you see something interesting. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, there's another question that says I might have missed it, but what's the natural predator? Natural predator of the uh, lanternfly? Mm -hmm. It's actually a couple, actually. I, I was going to put up a slide on that because I do love biological control. That's my uh, um, background. There's, uh, there's a few wasps. Um, Right now, there one of them is a, an egg parasitoid. Um, there's another one that actually attacks the uh, nymphal stage. Uh, the egg parasitoid, um, is it uh, Anastasis orientis? Uh, that one, that one in particular, um, it's kind of like the, that film Aliens. If anyone's ever watched that film, um, basically this wasp will actually um, oviposit its egg inside of the the uh, lanternfly egg, and like the film Aliens, it will eat its way out. Uh, so this is actually a uh, really kind of cool form of biological control. Uh, Dr. Kim Homer with uh, USDA has been actually doing a lot of research on the potential biological control of lanternfly. So that's one of the uh, wasps that they're studying. The other wasp is uh, Dorena sinicus. It's actually a really cool wasp, but you know, if we still have time, I'll try to pull up some slides, but the uh, wasp actually has uh, its forearms are actually very similar to those of a uh, praying mantis. And uh, like a praying mantis, it, it has raptorial claws, it will grab the nymph and actually oviposit into the nymph. And then you see these little sacs that hang outside of the body. It's kind of gross looking. But um, again, like um, anastatus, uh, it will actually feed on the hemolymph and the uh, fatty tissues of this, uh, of its host. And then it will suck the, uh, the lanternfly dry, kill it, and then it will actually um, um, pupate into the uh, near the uh, host tree that it's, uh, or for example, tree of heaven. And then it will do this whole process all over again in the next year. So it's a really cool insect. Um, I, I got to say, I, I worked really hard to get a couple of them in, in for my collection. It was, uh, that was a lot, a lot to uh, get through, but I'm also photographing these insects so that we can use these for... Uh, you know, scientific purpose, but also for events like this, where uh, we, uh, we, you know, let me see if I can't pull one up now that I, you've got me excited about this. But um, so basically it's, again, it's one of those opportunities where, let's see here. Um, let's see if I can't pull one up. This is from an older uh, PowerPoint slide. I'm hoping I have it. Well, anyways, long story short, the uh, 
there is some research that is going into that. Um, there's also some um, um, fungi, uh, fungi that they're studying as well to develop a fungicide uh, or some sort of biological um, application for a lanternfly. And it seems to be a, uh, uh, at least the uh, initial experiments seem to be um, promising. Um, but again, well, they'll have to conduct more experiments on the East Coast to figure out whether or not it's going to be a, uh, a usable product. Um, again, like all things, um, and Anne was right on to say, uh, make sure when you use any kind of um, pesticide or herbicide, read the labels. All right. Oh, gosh, I do have it. Okay, hang on. Let's see here. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully you guys can see this. So here's Anastasia orientis, uh, here's uh, Aranus uh, syndicus. Um, here's the both male, here's the male and female. Uh, these are really cool wasps in my opinion. Let's see if I can't pop this up. And then uh, like I was mentioning earlier, here's the uh, little uh, sac that develops on the side of the its, its host. Oop, hang on, let's go. There we go. Hopefully, hopefully you guys can see this. Oh, is it not sharing? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can see it. Oh, good, 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 good. Yep. So anyways, yeah, so these, these are some of the photos I took of uh, um, uh, Anastatus. And so the, these, the, this is actually really, I think really exciting. Um, and there's a lot of research being conducted on this. So um, hopefully this will be used um, down the road as a uh, biological control to help reduce the density of these uh, lanternflies on. And uh, hopefully we might even find them in our area. If, if Lanterfly shows up, hopefully they never do. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. All right, um, it's 11.03, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time and thank you all for joining us. Um, if you are here for a pesticide credit, uh, please in the chat, drop your uh, first name, last name, license number uh, and the state, Washington or Oregon, um, and then the code word, which is honeydew for this webinar. And while everyone's doing that, there was one more question about the spotted, uh, what is the next favorite tree plant that the spotted lantern fly prefers aside from tree or heaven? Oh gosh, that's that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I, I've, uh, I've heard that they will go after a, a couple of, uh, conifers. Um, so there's there's something that has uh, been a, a one that's a, a preferred and a preferred host, one of the preferred hosts, one of the many, because there's about 172. So that's that's I've I've been told that. Um, some of that I honestly I'd have to look that one up. Um, <laughs> honestly, um, it's I know I mean it's it's like uh, the brown marmorated stink bug. There's so many different uh Hosts like you, you'll see that they really do prefer, um, uh, you know, English holly, for example. Uh, and but then you'll see them doing just fine on pear, or they're doing fine on peach. And um, I do know that peach tends to be a, 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 a at least in, over in South Korea, that is one that lanternfly did really well on, and seems to have done such a great um, job that it actually um, became a, a bit of a crisis. And well, not a bit, but became literally a crisis for the uh, researchers over in South Korea. Um, lanternfly has also been detected in Japan. And for some odd reason, we don't know why, it's just not doing well over there. So the thing is, um, couldn't tell you right now. Um, there's, they're still figuring that one out. We don't really know, whole, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of work being conducted on this lanternfly, um, but still like we don't even have a lure for it. We don't have a very good trap. Um, you know, one of the difficulties of course is, uh, you know, finding, we, we know something in the tree of heaven, there's a, there's a chemical volatile that they're attracted to. Uh, we know that uh, at least the fourth instar around that region, they have to be exposed to uh, the tree of heaven, otherwise um, they become lethargic. Uh, so that is one of the things where, you know, tree of heaven is, is a priority host plant. But as far as a second, um, it might be a, um, a, uh, a cocktail effect, I would imagine. There's, there's probably a, a, a number of them, but. I couldn't think of any right off the top of my head right now, so. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thank you attendees for joining us this morning. Um, and a special thank you to all the speakers who took time out of their day to be here. Uh, we really appreciate your time and everyone have a good weekend.